Hello and welcome to the second part of our segment on Birds of Prey along with my special guest Mr. Shriver uh, and I can't forget his special guest right here, Empress the Female Golden Eagle. Uh, what we're going to talk a little bit about on this part of the segment is we're going to start off talking a little bit more about the Golden Eagles and some of their habits and mannerisms as well as uh, a little bit about the Bald Eagles and their comeback and other hawks that are found basically native to the east, not so much Pennsylvania, but to the east. So I'd like to turn it over a little bit here to Mr. Shriver and he can tell you a little about his bird here. Well, she is a six-year-old golden eagle. And like the male, as far as she's concerned, I'm the resident mate. And what we're doing here is our courtship. Uh, they, birds in their courtship, sit alongside of each other and preen each other's feathers. Uh, she does have a hard time finding enough hair on my head to work on, but she, she'll work on the hair on the side of my head. But they sit there and preen each other's feathers and yawn, which says a lot for their courtship. But uh, what's the matter to it? The, uh, all birds of prey do this, and I've seen most of them in their courtship. I might also add that these birds mate for life. Uh, they, uh, once they are paired up, they stay paired until something happens to one of them. Uh, and while they do mate for life, they have a very short mourning period. If it takes more than two days to get a new mate after something happens to the original, something's wrong. In fact, I've seen them uh, get a replacement the same day that something happened to the original. Uh, very, very short mourning period. Nature doesn't waste time. The golden eagle is a true eagle. The uh, Aquila eagle. They are found throughout the northern hemisphere in one form or another. The American golden and the Himalayan golden or bear cut golden are the two largest. They're the same, average the same size. Mm -hmm. The European bird is much redder, much smaller. Uh, most of the books won't tell you this, but our golden is sizable. You get a golden that weighs 14 pounds, you've got a huge female. They're not as big and heavy as a lot of people like to think they are. But the one I had that was killed in 1980 weighed 13 pounds. Mm -hmm. Furious when Lou hunted with her in Idaho and three winners killed 23 coyotes. 20 years ago in Cleveland, tied to a perch in his backyard, she killed his neighbor's 85-pound German Shepherd. Um, if we so could here. You've got a respect something yeah. like that. Um, is just to, to break a little bit here is maybe explain a little bit as to uh, the story behind the German Shepherd that, <laughs> uh, to let these people know. Well it, it gives you some idea of what goes on with these things. Um, Lou had uh, this friend of mine who had caught Furious on her first migration, trained her because she was so big, had three hawks in his yard and he had Furious in a flight cage out in the outskirts of Cleveland. And the neighbor's German Shepherd came through the hedge and killed the three hawks. And Lou went over to talk to the neighbor. And you have to know Lou to appreciate him. He, I, th I think he's our stereotype mafia. He's Sicilian, and he's short and stocky with a neatly trimmed coal black beard. Very mild-mannered, I think. Lou went over to talk to the neighbor, and the neighbor says, well, that's the way dogs are. What can you do? Lou didn't say anything. Went back, got furious out of the flight cage, put swivel, leash, eight foot leash on her, put her in the backyard on a three foot perch, went in the house, sat down, got a cup of coffee, sat down in the dining room where he could watch. He knew what was going to happen. Dog come through the head, saw the eagle come glomping up, furious, just come down horizontal. When the dog got within range, she come off at him. Seven foot three wingspan. Her front hook was two and three quarter inches long. Her hind one was three inches. You put her foot on a flat surface, it spanned 11 inches. And you're talking a bird with enough power in its feet to crush the bones of your forearm. Well, she hit that dog head and shoulders, clinched, released, and went back in the perch. The dog was dead. Hind hook had gone through the breastbone and through the heart. So Lou gathers up 85 pounds of German Shepherd, carries it through the hedge, lays it on a guy's back porch, and rings the doorbell. The guy came to the door, and, ah! and Lou says, well, that's the way eagles are. What can you do? But it gives you some idea the power of these things. The old time falconers used to take the big hens, train them, and successfully hunt timber wolves with them. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, they're just a tremendously powerful bird, much more powerful than the bald eagle. But the bald eagle is not a true eagle, where the golden is. Right. The true eagles are feathered down to the toes. Mm -hmm. The bald eagle is, well, they, the family is sea eagle, overgrown fish hawk. Mm -hmm. But the bald eagle is only found in North America, where the golden is found cosmopolitan in the Northern Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. But the bald has made a great comeback since uh, we quit using DDT, the savior of mankind, turned out to be almost a disaster. Uh, we went from a low of slightly under 5,000 birds in the lower 48 states in 1964 or 65. And the last kind I had was two years ago, 17,000. Mm -hmm. So we're better than, uh, better than three times increased. We've got five pair of balds at Pimatuming. I think there's only three of them breeding because two of them have new mates. And sometimes when they acquire a new mate, it'd be three or four years before they actually breed. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a pair at Erie National Wildlife Refuge. Been there for a couple of years. We've watched them in their courtship, have not built a nest yet. And then there's a pair at, Pi at Kinzu. Mm -hmm. uh, again, no nest. We keep getting told about nests, but all we can find is red tips. Mm -hmm. uh, a small eagle nest is five and a half foot cross and five foot deep. That's a small one. And that's one awful lot of sticks. I mean, that is big. Uh, the classic eagle nest, the tree finally gave up and fell over. It was out in Vermilion, Ohio. It was a bald eagle, had used it for, I think, 55 years. The nest measured seven foot across, was 23 foot thick when the tree gave up and fell over. Uh, figure it weighed somewhere between four and seven tons. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of sticks. Um, one thing also that I'd like to mention again here while we're talking about the bald eagles and bald eagle nest is for the most part, if you find a bald eagle nest, it will be in a place like Pima Tuning or uh, surrounding areas, and they are protected by the Game Commission. They are cordoned off with ropes and generally for quite a few hundred yards. The reason for this is before they did that, people were curious and going up to the nest, and as a result, the eagles weren't breeding. So if you do by chance, and if you do, it would be a slim chance, but if you do come across a bald eagle that is not uh, roped off or not restricted or anything, do not go near it. Stay back as far as you can. Use binoculars. That's what binoculars are made for. Please use them. Do not disturb these birds because, as Mr. Shriver said, they are on a comeback now and a very successful comeback. And I would just hate to see anything happen to uh, deter this or retard this in any way. Uh, Mr. Shriver, can, uh, you can continue now. I well, just wanted to put that uh, in. Uh, one of the things that I, on the eagles, the bald eagle, the golden eagle, are on the same law. The law does not differentiate between the two of them. Uh, and the, the penalties are the same. According to the law, you may not possess an eagle or any parts thereof. I can't give the feathers these birds molt away because of this law. You may not possess an eagle or any parts thereof without a special federal permit. Show me a federal permit, I'll give you eagle feathers. But uh, again, I had a bird killed in 1980. The boys that did the killing, they come in at night, clubbed her to death. The 18-year-old served two and a half years in federal penitentiary for killing the eagle. The 17-year-old got hit with a $5,000 fine for killing the eagle. This is what the federal fines are law is on eagles. Uh, they're getting awfully tough on it too. They don't play, the feds aren't playing games with these things. Let's see if she finds something of interest down there. One thing I'd like to do, uh, I don't know since she's a little rowdy now if we can, but uh, is to try to get her hackles to come up to let the people see just one of the uh, defensive things or... Uh, I doubt if she'll do it, but uh, the name Golden comes from the back of the neck, this. That's where they get the name. And they do have big wings. She goes about seven, stretch. <laughs> she goes about seven foot. I've never had anyone offer to help me stretch her and measure her. But I wouldn't try anyway. But she is an average female golden eagle. 
But one of the things we get into uh, with working with the birds, not just the eagles, mm -hmm. is the banding. And I'm not sure anymore which is more fun to me, the falconry end of it or the banding. Uh, we banded last year, and again, it's not a bird of prey, but we banded 27 young ravens in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. This year we went raven banding the 12th and 13th of April, which is the first weekend of trout season. Mm -hmm. And of course, most of our ravens are cliff nesters. They nest on trout streams. And we have to comment about these crazy idiots down there wading around the water, drowning worms. Us sane people are up there running up and down the cliffs. But uh, we only banded 12. Mm -hmm. But I saw a raven, and I've been banding ravens since 56. I saw a raven do something I had never seen one do before. We had tried to find a nest on Tuscarora Mountain, right off of Route 30. Park on 30, and there's a little dip down to a creek, and then you got the mountainside. We're over where they had nested last year, nothing there. The black vultures are there, but the raven is not. So uh, we went back to the cars, and we're standing around having lunch and drinking a little schnapps here and there. Raven come over our head carrying a hunk of meat. I hollered the boys, watch her. He's headed for the nest. Went across to the mountain, got into a flock of turkey vultures. Now, ravens, when they soar, have a wings down attitude. Mm -hmm. Turkey vultures have a wings up attitude. Right. You know that raven was soaring with a wings up attitude? Soared with those turkey vultures, and they slowly drifted up the mountain, and all of a sudden, just like a rock, he dove. And I think all he was doing is trying to make us forget all about him. Right. Went over and there's a female on three, on four eggs. Mm -hmm. Very late nest. Uh, so we'll have to go back and band it. And it's on a cliff you can't see from the road. A little cliff you can't see from the road. The most fun I have banding, though, is goshawks. Last year I banded 34 young goshawks. Most of these are in New York. We have a few in Pennsylvania. The goshawk is a bird that when you go to its nest, you're going to get hit. And you get a bird the size of that red tail doing 50, 60 mile an hour and screaming the whole way. They don't care whether you know they're mm -hmm. coming or not. Uh, it's fun. Of course, my idea of fun doesn't agree with everyone else's, but I wear a hard hat, canvas jacket. Last year, I forgot my canvas jacket. So I got three ripped up shirts and three ripped up t-shirts. and I was in them while this was going on. And you know, you get 40, 50 feet up in a tree, and she's coming at you, it's awfully hard to duck. Mm -hmm. um, they'll really work on you. I, I like it. It, it. You get some real close looks at goshawks right before they hit you. We get shown goshawk nests every year by lumbermen driven out of the woods, uh, trout fishermen driven off the streams. A tough bird, and, uh, but probably the best hunter for falconry that there is. Mm -hmm. You've seen, you saw mine last year. Right. Uh, great birds. But uh, that trip will be coming up. Well, I'm going to try to go up into the North Country. I'm talking Watertown and above mm -hmm. this weekend to look for goss nests. And uh, then in the first week of June, we'll be up there banding. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that's automatic. First week of June, forget me, I'm gone north. Me and the mosquitoes and black flies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, the, uh, as far as banding birds, the, you mentioned the ravens and the goshawk. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit, uh, we mentioned it briefly in last week's segment, but talk a little bit about banding the red tails as they migrate down the ridge. Uh, I think that may be of some interest Well, here. it's fun. Uh, I don't know that we accomplish a whole heck of a lot because, number one, you don't know where that bird's coming from. Mm -hmm. All you know is where it is today and it's approximate age, uh, where when you're banding in a nest, that's a starting point. You know where the bird came from. Mm -hmm. When you're trapping on migration, you don't. But it is a lot of fun. Uh, hard on pigeons. Mm -hmm. Two things were hard on around my place, cats and pigeons. Uh, but uh, the birds migrate to ridges of Pennsylvania in tremendous numbers. I don't think you've been fortunate enough to be out there when you've got several thousand red tails go through no, in a yet. day. You don't catch many mm -hmm. because there's too many red tails. Right. But uh, they will do this. We use a pigeon and we use nets. Mm -hmm. 
and the hawk comes down, grabs the pigeon, you pull the net over. We have a standard policy. Any pigeon that catches five hawks is retired for life. I haven't retired one yet. Uh, when a red tail grabs a pigeon, very few pigeons survive. Mm -hmm. And every now and then one of these things will come in on a pigeon, and that's dead pigeon right now. But we see a lot of birds come through that don't even come to the pigeon because they're not hungry. Mm -hmm. I only had three days on a ridge last year, and uh, I saw one peregrine falcon. I saw some red tails and caught a few. Caught a bunch of coopers. Uh, saw a lot of sharp shins. Mm -hmm. and they're fun. They buzz the pigeon, but the pigeon's three times bigger than they are. I actually plucked one out of the air with a bow net, mm -hmm. buzzing the pigeon last year. But uh, we'll see a few merlins, mm -hmm. osprey, red shoulders, red tails. Broad wings have usually gone through by the time we start trapping. Mm -hmm. So we don't see broad wings. But we do see goldens, and we see a few balds. Mm -hmm. Most of the balds don't migrate to ridges. Mm -hmm. They stay to the waterways. Now, uh, when we talk about the ridge, it's a special place uh, that you have set aside for banding. But if anyone out there is interested in seeing migrating birds during the migration, uh, I guess it's around Harrisburg, uh, the Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. Hawk Mountain's out near Reading. Okay. Hey, you're talking a uh, six-hour drive from here. Mm -hmm. And a couple problems. Number one, you have to pay to get in now. Mm -hmm. And number two, got to climb the mountain. Mm -hmm. And I, the geologists tell me these mountains are wearing down. I don't believe them. They're getting higher every year. Of course, Bob Gleason, my geology buddy, tells me it's because the cricks are wearing the bottoms out more. But uh, anyway, there is a better hawk watch a lot closer to Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. Down at McConnell's Mills, take Route 30 east of Pittsburgh, or east of Breezewood, and you'll bypass McConnell's Mills. It goes around the town. Mm -hmm. And you climb Tuscarora Mountain. Mm -hmm. As you come over the top, and I mean to tell you, that top is sharp. Mm -hmm. Right at the very top on the right is a mountain top in, mountain view in, something like this. As you approach it, you can see the rock outcropping behind it. Mm -hmm. You park in their parking lot, walk 100 yards back to the rock outcropping. Mm -hmm. They have actually taken rocks and built a f wall around it so you can sit down in your lawn chairs out of the wind mm -hmm. and watch migrating hawks. Uh, usually there's people there that know their birds. Charlie Brightbill's one. Mm -hmm. He's a school teacher down there. Every time he gets a sabbatical, he takes it up on the ridge. Uh, in fact, we'll compare notes. We'll trap all day and go down and find Charlie and mm -hmm. compare notes as who saw what that day. Mm -hmm. And usually it's identical. Uh, the only problem that could exist, and really it no, hasn't been any problem, about three years ago, a hang gliding club bought the cliff and they launch forth every now and then. Mm -hmm. In fact, when we were down banding ravens, it was blowing. And there was one of them up soaring on the updraft. Mm -hmm. I thought that would have been great fun. Uh, but so far, there's been no problem with mm -hmm. the bird watchers using it. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot closer than Hawk Mountain. Okay. You will see more eagles on Tuscarora Mountain, mm -hmm. which is the pulpit, right. than you will on Kittatinny, which is Hawk Mountain. Mm -hmm. The year, they 84, when they saw 57 at the pulpit, I think they saw 13 or 14 at Hawk Mountain. Mm -hmm. They just used Tuscarora. Right. Okay. Uh, and just briefly, too, if any of you have any questions as to the location of this or any information about it, please just write us or, in fact, give us a call, and we'll try to help you out with finding out where it is. Okay. Uh, basically, I think we've covered pretty much of uh, the birds of prey. One thing I would like to talk about that we just mentioned there is the sharp shin hawk. Uh, it, you really don't see too much of unless you have a pretty quick eye is from <laughs> my experience. Quick. They're small. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I would say a male sharp shin ever knocks down an English sparrow, he's in for the fight of his life. Uh, they're that small. Mm -hmm. Sharpies disappeared around here really as nesting birds uh, probably 30 years ago. The bird popu the warbler population went down, so on. All of a sudden, we've got sharpies again. Last year, I knew of two nests, one out of Murraysville, one in North Park. Mm -hmm. Both of them destroyed by great horns. Mm -hmm. Both of them, one young survived. 
I had the little mail from the one at North Park. I flew him what we call it hack mm -hmm. all summer, let him fly loose, keep him fed, and eventually he left. Mm -hmm. But he would fly around with his convoy of Blue Jays, and the Blue Jays were bigger than he was. Mm -hmm. Now, ravening up at Parker Dam, I was back in a red pine planting looking for a raven nest that had been taken out by the tornado, and we knew there was the ravens were still there. Mm -hmm. The nest is in those red pines someplace. We couldn't find it. And I'm probably half a mile off the road. And all of a sudden, there goes a little sharp, female sharpie out. Pretty bluebird, mm -hmm. adult. And I froze. And all of a sudden, here comes a little male in. Landed on a dead limb. Mm -hmm. He got a stick about eight inches long in his mouth. He turned around, saw me, and dropped it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where the nest is, and this is early. Mm -hmm. But they're building in there. So I just put a blaze on a tree and got out of there. We'll go back in later when they're on mm -hmm. eggs. Sharpies are delightful little things. And they nest in the Canadian bush in untold thousands mm -hmm. and come down the ridges. Mm -hmm. And they keep persistent budging, buzzing the pigeon. They want that pigeon, but the pigeon's too big. Exactly. And they're just around that pigeon like a mosquito. Mm -hmm. They're fun. OK, that brings us to another close. Uh, what I'd like to do here before we go off the air with this segment is let Mr. Shriver tell you just briefly uh, about the, the other birds that he has back at the house and that he does take on his lecturing tours with him. Mr. Shriver? Well, I, I've got a 16-year-old great horned owl that is technically an erythoristic, meaning red. Uh, right now, she's a pale yellow. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as we know, the only great horned owl of that color in existence the originator of the expression dumb blonde. They gotta be the dumbest thing with feathers. Uh, I have, and this is in big parentheses or quotes, a 19 year old raven by the name of what else Edgar Allan Poe, who is probably smarter than I am. He has been loose all five to six weeks now. And this isn't the first time this client's done this to me. When he gets loose, I get him back when he's ready. Mm -hmm. When he's ready to be tied up, he'll come down and land on my shoulder, and we're back in business. In the meantime, he's dismantling the neighborhood. Uh, we have to watch very close when he's around. He comes back and visits every day. Mm -hmm. He can untie knots. I can't tie the knot that he can't untie. So uh, he goes around and unties the rest of the birds. Mm -hmm. And neighbors don't mind the eagles in my yard, but when they get an eagle sitting on their roof, they tend to get a little uptight. I. Right now, that's about all I have. Now, I will be getting a goshawk. Mm -hmm. I'm lost without a goshawk. Uh, that's my favorite hunting bird. And normally at the lectures, I try to fly the goshawk. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it does people a world of good to see them with their wings open. Mm -hmm. And uh, the goss is great for this because they're always afraid of strangers yet they are so food oriented, mm -hmm. here they come for food. And they ignore everyone else around, but mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about them landing on anyone right. either. Where trying to fly one of these in a room or an auditorium, you can't do it, they're just too big. Mm -hmm. This one I could probably fly, but I wouldn't even try it. Okay. Uh I'd like to thank Mr. Shriver for coming on the program. I know that these two segments have been probably the most enjoyable that I've done so far, and hopefully all of you feel the same way. Again, at the end of the program, we will give the address and telephone number if any of you want to contact Mr. Shriver for lectures or just for some basic information on anything that uh, you may need to know. Uh, again, I just want to thank you all for joining us. I I'm sorry to be a little bit stunned here. I'm just I have this one golden eagle behind me that I don't think any of you can see and unfortunately his back has turned to me now and that's a rather hazardous place to be. <laughs> so uh, before anything more serious happens I'd just like to say thank you again for joining us and take care. We we'll hope to see you again. Okay, remember, if you have any questions or comments on the Nature Series, you can uh, get in touch with us by mail. Just send everything in care of the Nature Series, uh, or should I say address that to the Nature Series in care of Cable 7, 1820 McLaughlin Run Road, 
Pittsburgh, PA, 15241.